Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Nathan from Nathan Builds Robots, and I'm putting together a video with Luke from Luke's Lab. So it's a really cool collaboration that I was able to do with him. He's got a similar background as me. We're both mechanical engineers that are just really interested in 3D printing technology. And it was a good opportunity to just talk about all sorts of stuff. Our conversation went a bit long. I've got about eight hours of footage here. And I decided I'm going to break it up into a couple different portions. This first video is going to be all about 3D printer components and you know, the decisions that you'll have to make if you're specking out a 3D printer from the motion system to the considerations you'll need to make when building a frame to fastener selection and all sorts of different stuff. These are the kind of things that engineers will think about when designing a machine like a 3D printer. So if you're interested in like the nuts and bolts and the small details of putting a quality 3D printer together, then this video is for you. I'm just gonna throw this in the beginning so you know, you aren't expecting too much. It's just two guys talk and shop about 3D printers, 3D printer components, and the design considerations that we make when designing them. All right, well, here goes the video. All right, so today we're gonna check out Luke's lab. Uh, this is a guy who's done a lot of work designing and building his own 3D printer. We're gonna meet Luke, we're gonna meet the lab and just kinda learn about industrial 3D printing and what it means for him and his customers. So uh, I'm just gonna give it a knock and see if anyone's home. Hello? Oh, hey, hey Luke, how oh. you doing? Whoa, I didn't notice you were here. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got the camera and everything, so Whoa. we're ready to check it out. All right, awesome, well come on in. Okay, so we're here in Luke's lab. First I want to introduce Luke. He's got a lot of expertise when it comes to designing 3D printers. So, um, Luke, tell me a little bit about your backstory and how you got into all this. I'm a mechanical engineer, graduated from the University of wisconsin Platteville. In my second year there, I took an internship. That's when I got my first 3D printer. After I got that, I, I really loved it. Um, I wound up paying for my room and board and food, selling parts off that 3D printer, and that kind of continued. Uh, fast forward to, to COVID and everybody's printing stuff. They're printing face masks, face shields. Um, I printed 63,000 face shields for meat packers in Iowa. That was like a, a really big thing, especially with COVID of like, hey, we have a demand for production. People aren't in the factories right now, but some factories like food production needs to stay open. Like how do, how do we solve that? Okay, so what was that first printer that you ended up getting? It was a Flash Forge Creator Pro. It, it, was, a, it was the MakerBot 2X clone. Looking back, I paid 1300 bucks and I look at what you can get for $100 now in a standard Ender 3 and I take the Ender 3 every day of the week. If you have an idea and it doesn't really require engineering plastics, I think there's a metric crap ton of options for, for people just to take it and get started on production. Yeah, it's, it's really cool, honestly. So within Luke's lab, you've got a couple different operations. One of the core components of, of my shop is that everything that I sell on my store is stuff that I use in my own machines. So, I mean, you've gone as far as designing and building your own pod end here because yep. obviously that's one of the most important parts of a 3D printer. Yeah, it's the part that melts the plastic. If that doesn't work correctly, you're gonna deal with clogs, jams. I have uh, the, the wonderful acquaintance uh, of knowing very smart people who collaborate with me on a lot of this stuff. Um, so I, I do want to say that I'm not, you know, necessarily the original creator of everything here or that I'm the only person, um, you know, working on any of these things. And so a lot of these things are ping-ponging off of different people and then coming up with the correct solution overall. And then I'm just stubborn enough to get, actually get it physically made. Right. So. I've done that a few times. Like I, I see a product and I'm like, this could really be stand to be improved and then I'll design my own version of it. And when you make something better, other people will want that too. So mm -hmm. that just naturally leads to something that you can sell yep. to, to others. I kind of want to ask you, when it comes to 3D printers, what's the most important component? Like what's the hierarchy of what fails the most and contributes the most to the overall machine quality? Okay, so there are two separate things to think of there. Because you, you, you mentioned quality, but you also mentioned failed the most. Oftentimes the things that don't contribute to quality are the things that fail the most. Okay. Is, is, is really weird. Like motor selection, belt selection, and, and uh, you know, your, your motion system in general are probably the most important things for quality, but mm. they're the least likely things to fail. All the machines that I, I use here um, and, and put out for at least my stable bots have, have servos on them, right? So you get nice, crisp, clean motion control. Those things, they, they basically don't break and they're the most important thing for making sure that you position your, your hot end exactly where it is um, and that you uh, uh, don't wind up going off into the weeds or having like a skip, right? Mm -hmm. The things that fail the most 
um, at least before you know getting appropriate components like a hot end are, are really the uh, for me at least the extruder uh, clogs in the hot end um, I've actually uh, swaged nozzles shut so bed leveling is actually a, a really big one which is why we're so happy to be official beacon integrators a lot of the times it makes sense to have a, a fixed span of X amount of years or at least build in some sort of upgrade path down the road because technology does change. If you take a look at printers 10 years ago, and if I still was trying to rock my uh, uh, my flash forge, whatever it was. Hey, it uh, has stepper motors. It does it's have stepper belts. motors. It has belts, yes. But when you look at the, the core technologies in there, it would be far more effort and far more money and time and just tinkering to bring that to modern standards than it is to just start over from a new frame. So there, there are limits, but in general, everything that I have is very beefy. So when you have your motion system, the, the whole point is to increase stiffness as much as possible while re reducing weight. Yeah. That provides a much better response to inputs. So when your motors turn, you want your nozzle to instantly move. You don't want it to kind of move and then kind of wobble back until the belts come straight. So yeah. having a very dense frame that's very stiff, while the lightest possible effector for the stiffness is the, the most important thing. Yeah, and I would say um, that's something a lot of people might not realize is that the frame, you know, you think of it as the solid piece, but really it's quite flexible. Especially in the spring. <laughs> yeah, that's something you learn real early on and if you're studying engineering, mechanical engineering is that everything's a spring. Like, mm -hmm. you think like, okay, I get what you mean. Like, everything kind of acts like a spring, but no, really everything, no. even the hardest materials on the planet, even the ground that you step on yep. is at some level can be modeled by a spring. Yep. So, um, yeah, basically the ideal frame would be just, you get a gigantic block of steel and you yep. carve out the, the area that you want the motion components to be inside of. Exactly. And then you can move around in there. But of course, you don't want to be, you know, ordering gigantic billets of steel and carving them out. Like, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of waste of time, a lot of waste of effort, and a lot of very complex machinery to get that made to any kind of precision. I have had several generations of tool heads, several generations of gantry system even, where I've actually traveled to customers and brought them to the latest standard of technology while still using their base level frames. So it's, it's something that I, I take a great deal of pride in with my machines while still maintaining that solid core. Yeah, Underneath. so everyone's got to sign up for the Luke's Lab subscription upgrade program. <laughs> I'm sure yep. you're not upgrading it for no reason. You've got like value added stuff that you're putting into those. Oh, springs. yeah, yeah. Um, this, this upgrade featured my uh, new tool head, which does include the tube, um, but it also included a, a beacon upgrade as well because okay. they, uh, they, they were on a micro switch based leveling, um, which worked fine but it's not as fast and uh, it doesn't generate quite as, as dense of a mesh. So let's go back to what you were saying about, I never thought of it this way, but like the components that contribute to quality tend not to wear out or break as often. Most components actually follow that logic. Like stepper motors, you, you wanna have stepper motors that don't ring or yep. skip steps and that can yep. ruin your quality, but you're not out there replacing stepper motors basically ever. No. Um, Unless something has gone terribly wrong, you don't typically replace them. Right. Main boards, I guess main boards can break. Yeah, they're in, they're in kind of that sweet spot where having a good main board is important for um, the feature set that you might want. So you might want, you know, a certain amount of inputs for thermistors to make sure that your chamber temperature is accurate throughout. Or you might want uh, high voltage drivers that work correctly and can deliver the correct amount of amps, right? Yeah. So there's like that, that increase in quality point that makes a difference on um, your end prints. But at the same time, uh, the SKR Mini E, whatever they're on right now, yeah. it's like, what, 30 bucks, 20 bucks, mm -hmm. something like that. It does and, everything you need it to. And it does everything you need it to. Yeah. And you're not gonna get any better prints by tripling the cost of your of your board. And, but you know, at, at the same time, it doesn't break that much unless you've done something wrong or unless you're unlucky. So it's, yeah. it's really just kind of, it, right in the middle, I'd say. I would like to see more like uh, modularity, kind of like what Prusa has done with some of their latest products. They have like the PCI Express slot. Yep. Let's say your stepper motors have broken or like the main board fried, just pop it out and put a new one in. And yep. 
I really hope to see more of that in the industry, but we're not quite there yet, it seems like. We're not quite there yet. Uh, that'll ideally be coming on my next generation of printers, which we'll probably be talking about a bit later. Um, that's one of the, the, the core features of it, is to help keep uptime, which is one of the most important things for any kind of production machine. If, mm -hmm. if you have a large capital investment that you purchased a 10, 20, 30, 50, $100,000 machine that's meant to be producing parts, which makes your business profitable and functional, mm -hmm. if that machine is down, you have a lot of cost and a lot of other things going into that machine that are no longer functional. So um, Prusa has definitely got it right with quick swap modular replaceable parts that take old part out, put new part in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that um, I'll be focusing on. I just wanna to touch all the bases on yeah, 3D yeah. printer components to kind of get your feelings on them. So frame, motion system, main boards, uh, hot ends you said, basically, Hot ends you want to be as reliable as possible because as they're, possible. they're the main source of downtime, I would say, for my personal stuff. I, I would say so as well. Um, between uh, random clogging, depending on the material, not enough cooling, the fans that go with it, if that fan goes down, gets jammed or whatever, and you don't have a way to either detect the failure or a, a hot end that doesn't require it, it's, uh, it is a, a big pain in the butt because those kind of failures are either unnoticed uh, or um, if it fails and then starts again, you might have a giant ball of material that takes more precious time from you, have to replace other components and just general, not a very good time. So yeah. they're, they're very important and they're the, they're the thing that actually gets the job done, so. Right, they're probably, for me, I, I still really think that they're the leading cause of frustration with 3D printers. Part cooling is also very important. It seems like you've got your own kind of system that you use on most of your, your printers. Yeah, yeah, so I have uh, two different strategies that I use. Um, typically on stable bots, I'll go with a, a CPAP style. Um, uses CPAP hoses, but it uses uh, blowers that I, I source. They're the 9290s, they're on lukeslab.online.com. But uh, uh, they provide a, a lot of airflow um, and just routing the air through a, a tube. Um, and then the second one is using uh, larger server-based fans, which get a little noisy, get a little whiny, but they provide a lot of cooling to the tool head, which allows for much higher speeds and while st still keeping the same part quality overall. So like part quality or part cooling I would say contributes a lot to the quality of your finished product and your finished print. Right. I would say it's not a big cause of failures as long as you understand what the limits of your system are. Right. So it's one of those things where a fan isn't typically going to die unless you're in a very hot chamber and your fan isn't properly spec for it. But um, it's one of those things that can be confusing if you have an anemic cooling system. I've noticed that 90% of issues you get with insufficient part cooling can be solved with just slowing the printer way down. Correct. So that's always an option, but like you want to be able to, to print at speed. Yeah, ex exactly. You want your printer to make the part and make it come out. Everyone's amazed by the Creality K1s and all this stuff that you can purchase and it goes faster than your Prusa did or your Ender did three years ago, right? Yeah. And they're, they're insane. It is really important to, to balance all of the things as you move forward. You put on a bigger hot end, you need a bigger part cooling fan. Otherwise, you're you're just not gonna be able to keep up and you're gonna be lagging behind in some area that, that keeps you constrained. So you gotta make sure you understand where your limits are. So. And then in terms of extruders, what are, are you a fan of Bowden or direct drive or so, dual gear, single gear, large um, drive gears? Like. So uh, direct drive all day, uh, Bowden is utter trash in my opinion. Mm, um, yeah, I, I'm of the same opinion, but I'm sure there'll be someone in the comments that'll disagree. So <laughs> I have one good thing to say about Bowden is that uh, issue six or whatever with the, uh, you know, some cases where you can see inconsistent things because of feeding and you switch to Bowden and it works. Yeah. That, that may be true. The trade-offs, even though you're removing weight from the tool head, right? Because we spoke about reducing weight from your tool head to make it uh, better for the stiffness. It, it adds so much complexity for the filament path, making sure that you can get enough extrusion force. It really affects the pressure advance where when you speed up and slow down, you need to be able to, to control that extrusion to make sure you get a consistent bead around a corner instead yeah. of slowing down, having the residual pressure leak out and then not have enough when it starts over again. Yeah, I think one thing a lot of people don't appreciate is how imprecise the, the practice of 3D printing really is. It's a hot glue gun. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you know, like, you can't get the same level of precision that you can get on a on like a CNC machine. Yeah. Simply because you're like, okay, I'm squishing that out and I think this such is coming out, but I don't really know. I'm plus or minus five or 10% in a lot of cases. So I think we talked about like basically all the components. Is there anything I missed there? A lot of it does just come down to sourcing, having a source that's trusted and isn't just some random person throwing together, uh, you know, some, 
some parts and then shipping them out is like, hey, this is a PT-1000, but is it really? Like, yeah. what's, what's going on in here? So you gotta have um, good components there. So once you get all the you know, good trusted sources that have a uh, long service life, that really solves a lot of other problems. You don't wanna buy the $2 AliExpress special from uh, uh, the nth store, blah, blah, blah. You yeah. wanna get it from trusted- Or Amazon. <laughs> yeah, Amazon, the, the second AliExpress. Right. Um, so you wanna, you wanna just make sure that those are trusted. I do wanna get down to one finer level of granularity here. Right. Belts and bearings, thermistors and heating elements, and nuts and bolts. So belts and bearings, like, okay. I've never had an issue with belts, although everyone says you have to get like a certain kind. I'm just like, uh, just get, get whatever. Nope, buy gates. <laughs> okay, yep, gates all the way. Uh, yeah, I will preface that. Um, so the, the gate series just seems to be the best uh, option for the registration that 3D printers need. Almost any normal retailer for uh, 3D printer parts like Fabrico, DFH, Filostruder, those people list those. There's plenty of alternate uh, ways of moving your tool head, right? You can do a ball screw or a lead screw mm -hmm. for, for the tool heads. But the problem is, is you with those, you have a lot of mass that you need to move back and forth by just spinning the ball screw. And you're not really using the load rating of the ball screw. Because ball screws are using CNC's where right. they're doing subtractive processes. With 3D printers, the most you're gonna push through is a print that lifted up and you're, you know, you're gonna smack it off. Right. And, and so belts make the most sense. And um, even in those cases, it actually helps to have a little bit of compliance in the system because it helps kind of limit the load a little bit. Correct. Like you'll, you'll just kind of like boing. Like yeah. bounce or, or you'll skip a belt or, or you'll pop the belt, which may or may not save you depending on what kind of sensing you have. I actually bought uh, my first pair of ball screws uh, and I'm playing with them, mm -hmm. you know, and they're so smooth. They're like extremely buttery smooth and like yep. it really makes me want to make a machine with them. I think you probably can get a marginal level of extra quality out of them. It's it is several magnitudes more complexity. Um, you also have a machine that can now snap your hands That's a good because of, of how much force <laughs> it can exert on, on your arm. Um, I'm already kind of scared to move my hands inside of my machines already with how much um, mass is moving and how fast it's moving and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I will avoid that portion of it, but um, it's really not a big advantage unless you're in extreme environments like like crazy high temps, like 300 C plus, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, belts are honestly uh, easy to use, affordable, and, and you can just get replacements if you really need to. One of the reasons why people like 3D printers so much compared to other manufacturing technologies is it's relatively safe. Like if you stick your hand relatively in a CNC safe. machine and you can, you can do some real damage, you could lose yeah. an arm. Most 3D printers aren't at the level of strength that they Correct. could do real damage to your body. So I'll, I'll go in and manhandle the thing while it's running sometimes. Yeah, other than burn you if you're not careful. Oh yeah, they, they do get hot. So you gotta watch out for that. Yeah, they do get hot. Pay attention to your wiring and, and your hot ends. One of the things that I, I see is uh, really high wattage heaters. Um, I'm guilty of it as well. The, the tube, because of its flow and because of its high temp requirements, can have a, a heater on there that if you know, if, if it's locked open, if a component fails on the electrical control board, that's where quality matters for mm -hmm. those, um, it could theoretically melt it into a pile of copper. And this isn't unique to the, the tube or anything like that. You put right. too much wattage in anything, you can have a very bad time. Even like on a, a regular 40 watt heater cartridge, you can melt aluminum. Correct, exactly. I have, uh, I've done that when the firmware, smoothieware, um, locked up and I came back to a very smelly room and a pile of aluminum and it also melted my glass. Okay. My glass bed at the time, it was very scary. You've got a lot of bearings on a 3D printer, yes. whether they're rotary for like managing the belt path mm -hmm. or linear bearings for mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the different parts that move back and forth and left and right. Yep. So what's your kind of, what do you do for that kind of stuff? What I use is- uh, Is it V-Groove wheels? V-Groove wheels are perfectly fine if you are constrained by budget and you have absolutely no need for consistent performance throughout. So if you just need a printer that works, you're printing trinkets with it, you're not looking for extreme speed, and you don't care if you have to maintain it every couple hundred hours, whatever, they're, they're perfectly fine. Yeah, um, they're actually great. Like for, for a really cheap machine. Yeah, they, yeah they, they, they work perfectly. Components are readily available. If you have more time than money, perfect. But the second you start getting to enclosed heated builds or like even just warm builds, right? They're gonna 
fall apart, you're gonna develop looseness and you're just gonna have a really bad time. So in general, I try to stick with uh, linear bearings, typically uh, like MGN12, MGN15, um, those, those kind. Um, they provide constraint in all the directions that I really care about. I'm not a big fan of linear rods, even though they have their uses, um, but you really need to understand the trade-offs, whereas using uh, the linear rails that we use now with our extrusions is honestly a, a, a great, um, a great solution for the demands of our, our systems. Yeah, I think it's a, it has to do with the scale of the 3D printer. So smaller printers, linear rods can make a lot of sense. But when you get to like these, I don't know what your biggest printers are, like one meter. I got a 700 spans. by 700 over there. Okay, so when, you're, when <laughs> you've got this much spanned across, like even a one inch thick bar is gonna be relatively flexible in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why you need a linear rail to like have it backed up against something. And exactly, because linear rails are not really meant to support the weight of the actual object. They're just meant to guide it with something else providing the structure and the strength behind it. So being able to bolt it onto extrusion that you can buy from Misumi or 10,000 other places. I mean, we make probably millions of tons of these things a year mm -hmm. um, and it bolts in and you can adjust your preloads and all sorts of stuff very, very, very easily. Okay. So they're, it, it's a combination of accessibility, price, and they're honestly pretty overbuilt for 3D printers in general yeah. um, because they can handle quite a bit more load than we actually put on them. So I do want to speak up for V-Groove wheels a little bit. Uh, if you've got a really cheap frame, like a lot of 3D printers are assembled very inexpensively, we'll say. And, they're uh, value-based. Yeah. So like if the frame's crooked at all, the V-Groove wheels will provide a little bit of compliance and suspension mm -hmm. to kind of allow it to work versus if you're using linear rails on everything, even on, especially on like a really cheap machine that might have a crooked frame, then those rails might bind, whereas the V-Groove wheels will just roll right over it. If so you're using linear rails, but your extrusion, your mounting surface looks like a banana, the, you're gonna have a really bad time with some binding, especially if you have two rails that are supposed to go parallel and one of them's a little over here, you're gonna get binding, your print's not gonna work, and you're just gonna be sitting around and people are gonna tell you to level your bed. I've noticed that every single time I buy anything, like stock material, if you go to Home Depot and look at two by fours, you'll see they're all warped. But that also extends to buying stock metals and extrusions yeah. and linear rails and rods and everything. Yep. Like if you take just two random pieces of metal, usually they'll stack nicely because they both have the same curve to them. But if you flip one of them over, then you'll see that they don't sit flat against each other. Yep. But you've got some really nice stuff here. And uh, let's take a look at it. So, I mean, there's so many issues that you get into with if you have large printers and the materials aren't straight and flat. Correct. I think that's what a lot of 3D printer companies have issues with. They'll scale up their smaller designs and then it's like the bed leveling just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen on so many printers, especially at the budget end. Yep. I think a lot of these companies don't understand the, the requirement for quality materials and like flatness tolerances. Or they're meeting a price point in the call of the day. Yeah, I mean, I just hate having that stuff on my channel because it's like, you didn't do your work, why are you expecting me to do my work to sell these things for you when they're clearly not good? Okay. So I've had to cancel a lot of you know, collaborations with companies just because they can't get that part right. With your attention to detail, I think you, you've identified the components and suppliers that can give you really yes. str like flat, straight materials. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is like a special type of material, right? So this is a cast tooling plate. Um, it's, a, it's aluminum. Uh, they come in several different uh, material blends. I believe this one is a 5000 series denoted by the uh, Alka 5. What's really special about this is that uh, compared to a lot of different materials that are made in sheet and plate form, which are either cold or hot rolled, where the material is, is warmed up and then pushed through a series of cylinders that presses it flat, um, this stuff is either horizontally or vertically cast, depending on the, the kind, and then specifically stress relieved to prevent the formation of, of grains that have op opposing stresses. Thanks. You're losing us here, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll dumb it down or, <laughs> no, that's not fair. I'll, I'll simplify it. No, no, no. Um, uh, when you heat this plate up, it's not gonna behave in a way where there's stresses that are built into it from the forming process. And then, so at room temperature, it takes on one shape. And when you heat it up, the grains, the individual pieces of metal inside of it that make up the, the composite, uh, they start to flex, they start to shift, they start to go. And then all of a sudden you get like a taco by just heating it up. Cast tooling plate, uh, Alka 5, Mix 6, is specifically relieved and, and, and brought to the correct temperature to prevent the formation of, of those little cells that cause that deformation so that it expands very well. Um, to that end, um, the material even comes pre-ground, uh, pre 
pre uh, uh, fly cuts to a specific flatness. You can find the specs online. Yeah. So that every piece you get is is guaranteed to do it for this exact reason. 6061 is like what most things are made out of when it comes to aluminum. Pretty much, yeah. The, I guess the downside with this stuff is it's got a lower uh, yield strength. Slightly. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit weaker, so maybe people won't like that. Yeah, but for the for the flatness, the fact that you can basically just pop holes in it and bolt stuff to it and you, you just know it's flat. Um, most of the uh, industrial manufacturing engineers that I know, when they design fixtures, they just buy this, they bolt it together, it is better than the part we are making. And they just use it as a check fixture right there. Like that's how consistent and, and constant this, this stuff is in industry. Um, so unless you're dealing with stuff that's incredibly precise, this is more than enough in almost every case. Yeah. Um, one of the other components though, is that you're kind of hefting around is that you need the correct thickness for, for what you're going for. So these right. are half inch plates. Um, this is about as thin as I'd go for this size of build plate. This is for a 500 by 500 stable bot. This is actually to prevent some sag in the middle as well. So if you have a quarter inch plate and you're even trying to span like 300 millimeters mm -hmm. and you're trying to lift, you'll notice that the material actually deforms under its own weight. And so you need to make sure that you pick the correct strength or have some other accommodations, whether it's some sort of jacking screws and that's his own problem. Yeah. Um, I know in guitars, in guitars, they have like a, a little stress carrying rod inside of the wood. Like yeah. It, you could it, do that here. If you... it, exactly. There's, you have to have some, some way of, of dealing with it, um, which is kind of annoying because uh, uh, heat does other funky things um, right. sometimes. So other components. Not, not to this though. This stuff expands very linearly. Okay, you know, the flatness of this, your build place is very important, mm -hmm. but also the frames, they need to be pretty flat as well. Yep. So, you know, you have to have like high quality suppliers for all this stuff just to make sure that you, you that get is, all the good stuff. Yeah, that is correct. Um, so we uh, get all of our frames, at least our standard sizes, which is like a 500 by 500 um, size frame. Uh, we get all of our stuff from LDO. They've been great partners to us over the years. Okay. I'm just gonna plug for them right now. LDO, uh, yeah. yeah. Jason. I don't have an affiliate link, but uh, yeah, Jason, he's a great guy. I've met him a couple of times. Jason is amazing. Uh, he's always treated me right ever since I'm small. Um, I'm, I'm tiny compared to most of the other venues he still works with, and he treats me like I'm, I'm equivalent to these places that are doing millions and millions of dollars in business. So um, I have uh, the utmost respect and gratitude for it, and that's the frames we use because they, they work. And if they don't work, they support it and they fix it. So. Right. Yeah, if you get the uh, the AliExpress special, they're gonna, be, they're gonna be like, hey, we sent it to you. Banana. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You got metal, didn't you? You're happy, right? right. I wanna ask you about water cooling, so. Uh... Garbage. Okay. 1% <laughs> of people who think they want water cooling should actually be doing water cooling. Right. There are very specific specialty applications that should be doing water cooling. Um, the rest of it should just either get better air cooling or, or figure out some other some other solution for, for their problem. So yeah. um, water cooling will allow you to put things like a tool board in a really hot enclosure or allow you to cool your heat break and um, print a material uh, that the chamber is far above the temperature of the material's melting deformation temperature because you can't cool down something below the ambient temperatures. That's where water cooling is useful. So water cooling changes that, that equation with a different ambient from over there, right? Okay. But those solutions are also possible with a small air tube with like a bird configuration where you're blowing air over the heat sink. Oh, uh, and then uh, nuts and bolts. I do have a problem here okay. with, uh, you're using these torque spits, which, uh -huh. which I don't know about that. And also, you, you have these little grub screws. So I'm, I'm of the, the school of thought that if you can't fit a socket head cap screw, you should just go home. That is a very strong opinion. I would tend to agree with that opinion. The reason we have all of these different screw types is to allow for complexity. So I, I am not a fan of flat head screws at all. Mm -hmm. And yet, you'll find them featured everywhere on the tube. And the reason for that is that the flat head allows for a centering force mm, when you yeah. torque it in. So your parts go together and they go to the other consistently every time. And that's part of the assembly. That makes Those sense. Those grub screws are also for only retention of the heaters, um, which is why they're, they're important. Because otherwise you could not remove the heater core if you had a head on top of your heater. So uh, those are some of the engineering choices why other fasteners do exist. In general, yeah, socket heads all day. Even button heads, I mean, I'm a little... I use a lot of button heads. They do look better. If they're on the outside, people are gonna like seeing the button heads and, yeah. you know. If I use button heads on a 500 by 500 stable bot, that gets me a quarter inch of clearance to the standard American door. Okay. 
So <laughs> it's there for a reason. My main thing is I deal with like so many cheap 3D printers in my, in my uh, line of work. Swiss cheese. You turn oh. it and then it's like, oh, well that just stripped out and there's no way to, so I have to get my blowtorch out and, or uh, blow chisel. Torch. I mean, you know, whatever I have within You're arm's reach. You're a madman. At the time. Try for an easy out or get better tools. I need an easy out. Yeah, that's for sure. Do you have sharp uh, hex tools too? So I, I actually have my own stuff. Uh, we, we haven't sold it for a while, uh, so I might have to relist it again. They work really well compared to like a not very sharp or like a, 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 like a bent and formed instead of machined. Yeah. These are CNC machine tips, quite sharp, and they, uh, they definitely reduce the amount of strip out. That was a great chat about like 3D printer components. I mean, you're gonna save a lot of time doing this because I'll just be able to consult this video instead of <laughs> hitting up on Discord, but. Uh... Anytime, I'm always willing to talk. All right. Honestly, I, I, I learn stuff um, and every customer that comes to me with a problem or any person that comes to me with a problem, uh, I learned something and that's really what, what I, life is about really. Yeah, yeah, you, lifelong learner attitude here, right? Yep, our, our company motto is uh, the two-step process, which is get good. So uh, that's, that's what I do every day. I've, I've heard you say that a couple of times. Now we I have merch what. now.